I'm honored uh, to run for governor. I love Illinois passionately. It's home. I was born and raised here. We raised our six kids here. I've built many businesses here. I love Illinois. And I have been very upset by the condition of our state and the trends in our state. Uh, hundreds of people I know are leaving. Many of the companies I've been involved with are leaving. Uh, many fellow business owners that I know are leaving the state. And I'm deeply troubled. And uh, frankly, I've had some of my fellow business partners say to me, Bruce, you should leave too. That you can see that the state is trending very badly. And you could be turning the lights off in Illinois in the next five to 10 years. And you should get out while the getting's good. And the number one place they asked me to move to is Texas. And I say, heck no, I ain't ever leaving. I'll fight with everything I've got to restore the prosperity in Illinois uh, before I'd ever, I'm not leaving. That's the reason I decided to run for governor. I've asked, I've asked a number of people over the years to, uh, to, to run for governor. We need a good person who's a leader and a problem solver, and frankly, somebody with business experience, and I've asked a number of folks. Couldn't get the right person to run, and I decided, you know what, I think I can do this. I know I can do it. And I know we can turn the state around. Because we, so we have every reason to thrive. We have every reason to thrive. Hardest working families in America, most fertile farms in America, um, uh, the best location of any state in America, uh, had the best infrastructure, although we're letting it deteriorate, uh, with the capital of the heart of the United States right here. We should be thriving. We should be one of the fastest growing states. Uh, we should have the be most best careers and the best you know, schools. And we have every reason, except we don't have leadership in the state government. And we don't have good politics in the state government. And I decided to put my hat in the ring and try to change that. I, I've never run for office, uh, but I'm a hard worker and I'm a good student. And uh, I've been studying with governors around America how they turn their states around. Uh, Indiana, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, Bobby Jindal, Jeb Bush, Chris Christie. I've been studying with governors for the last three, four years, learning what they did, how they did it. Um, and I'm honored to go to work for the people of the state. I got my work ethic from my grandparents primarily, who I spent a lot of time with growing up. My uh, grandparents were dairy farmers, had dairy cows and corn, within a little double wide trailer, mostly in Whitewater, Wisconsin. Spoke Swedish more than English. My grandfather was the kind of guy, he'd, he, was, he was also a factory worker, also a union member, a proud union member. He worked in a factory making butter and cottage cheese for Hawthorne Melody. I get spun as anti-union, I'm not. Um, and, uh, but he, he, he believed in three things. Hard work, good education is the key to getting a better life, and giving back in the community. I believe, as the Bible says, to whom much has been given, from whom much is expected in return. I, at my heart, I'm a do-gooder person. My wife and I, that's one, my wife and I share that passion. She's a Democrat, I'm a Republican, it's okay. People can have big hearts in each party. <laughs> and I'm doing this as my way to give back. You know what, I've worked my whole career working for teachers. I'm very proud of that. I've worked for teachers. I've worked for state police officers, and I've worked for government workers because I've been investing primarily pension money in my business. And I'm proud to say for teachers in Illinois, I've done a phenomenal job, generated 25% annual returns for their retirement. I'm very honored by that success. Uh, but we've also generated very attractive returns uh, in the pensions for everybody we've invested on behalf of. We've got a great track record. I'm proud of it. It's not, we're not perfect. Not every company we invested in worked out. But we've invested in over 400 companies and a great track record of success. And with the, the money I've made in the process, I'm not a big, uh, high-living person. Um, I get spun as being wealthy. I don't apologize. I'm, I've made a lot of money. I didn't inherit any of it. Made it all myself. Uh, but I believe in giving back. So my wife and I have donated tens of millions of dollars back into our community. Do donated primarily to public education, school choice possibilities, teacher training, um, principal development, scholarships for low-income kids, vouchers uh, for low-income kids. Uh, early childhood education, which is what my wife devotes her uh, personal career to. She doesn't take a salary doing that, but she runs out to prevention. Um, but also uh, big with Red Cross, helped build their regional headquarters for the Midwest. Uh, the YMCA helped build the YMCA. Uh, very big on veterans support services. I'm a big advocate for veterans. My wife and I have donated a lot of money to honor flights for World War II veterans, uh, Navy Scholarship, uh, or Navy SEALs Foundation, Marine Scholarship Fund. Uh, I helped found an organization called A Safe Haven, which provides homeless um, services uh, for veterans who are struggling to get on their feet and counseling services so they can get established in life. I believe very much in giving back and supporting veterans. All that to say, not to, not to brag or toot a horn, but to say I care, I, I want to give back, and I make a lot of money, and I save my money so I can give it away. I'm, I'm, I've told my kids they're not going to get a big inheritance. We're going to give away 
a lot of money. Uh, this governor's race is obviously costing me a lot of money, but that's okay. I can afford it. And I would never ask for the support of the thousands and thousands of donors we've had, and if I didn't support myself. So I've, I've raised a lot, but I've also donated a lot. As governor, I'm not going to take a salary or a pension. I can afford not to. I'd rather the taxpayers keep that money. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, fellow business executives who've been leaders and problem solvers uh, to give back with me and come in and maybe not take salaries either, to come in and help turn the government around and get it run right. I'm actually very excited to come and live here with my primary um, residence being in the governor's residence. To me, it's an honor. I think the government should be run from Springfield, not from Chicago. Um, it's, uh, you know, the governor's residence is the, it's, it's the seat of the, of the administration. Uh, we should treat that home with respect. We should take care of it. We should run the government primarily from here. Um, and I look forward to making sure that the, the home is well maintained and uh, brought back up to where it should be and, and treated with respect. I will do what I can to bring back uh, the administration and the government departments back from Chicago to Springfield. I know uh, Governor Blagojevich as payback for Sangamon County not supporting him, moved a lot of the uh, government administration out of Sangamon County. I'd like to reverse a lot of that. Uh, I, be I believe this is the state capital and this is where the state should be run from. Clearly there's going to be some activity in Chicago too, but, but uh, I look forward to making that happen. Uh, people are always asking me, well, you really moved to Springfield. This will be my primary residence. We're, we're st we'll still, you know, I'll be traveling a lot all over the state, you know, from Rockford to Quincy to Mount Vernon to uh, Danville. I'm going to be all over the place. We probably won't sell our uh, suburban Chicago home. We'll probably keep that. We're very t we built that, and our kids were all were raised in it, so we'll probably keep it emotionally, but that won't be where I spend the bulk of my time. But I'm honored to go to work. We need big change, and this is we have to have dramatic change. We, we can't nibble around the edges. We can't just slow down the death spiral. We've lost our balance as a state. We've become a one-party state. Democracy doesn't work well on a one-party basis. And I don't care whether you're a Democrat or Republican. We need two parties. And I've, I, I will be a bipartisan problem solver. Um, we have become hostile to business. Uh, and that's in the Quinn administration, and that's in the General Assembly. There's a mindset in our, in our state government that business is an opponent. Business doesn't pay enough tax. Business needs to be regulated more. And as a result, we're not competitive. And a lot of companies don't feel appreciated here, and a lot of companies are leaving. That's the number one surprise of this campaign as I've traveled the state, 145,000 miles I've driven the state. I've met with hundreds and hundreds of business owners. So many of them feel like Illinois is not a place for them. They feel underappreciated and, and rejected, and a lot of them are leaving, more than, more than I realized when I started this campaign. And I've said, give me 24 months. Let me see. I think I can get a different climate here for you. I think I can get a more competitive tax code. I think I can get a more uh, favorable regulatory climate. Stay here. Grow. It's the number one thing we've got to do is become a growth state. We can't fix our problems. We can't fund our pensions. We can't pay for our health care. We can't fund our schools if we're not growing. And we're at the bottom of the barrel on economic growth. We're among the bottom 10 states rather than the top. And our only solution that our politicians seem to propose is more income taxes. More, no. We don't need more taxes. We're already among the highest tax states. We need to change how we spend the money and how we tax, overhaul our tax code so we're more competitive, and we need to become a growth state. Single most important thing, pro-growth. Growth solves our problems on unemployment, on careers, on wages, on funding for our pensions and our education. We've got to become a growth state. Right now, we're not and haven't been. We've lost over 48,000 jobs under Governor Quinn. While the rest of the country is growing, we've lost 48,000 manufacturing jobs in Illinois. We lost 2,500 manufacturing jobs just last month. Um, he's touting that we've turned the corner. We have not turned the corner. Yes, our unemployment rate's down a bit, but it was still one of the highest in the United States. And we've had more families give up looking for work this year than have gotten jobs. And we are among the lowest rates of job creation of any state, and we've lost, we're losing, we're still losing manufacturing jobs. We have not turned the corner. We're in deep trouble, and we've got to change. So I'm honored. I, I want to go to work here in Springfield to change the system. I will work on a bipartisan basis. I've been a bipartisan problem solver. I worked with the mayors in Chicago, McCormick Place reform. Uh, school reform and tourism growth. Uh, I've worked with Democrats and Republicans. I'm respected on both sides of the aisle. And I'll tell you this, I'm in the middle of getting to know every member of the General Assembly personally. I want to get to know everybody on a first name basis. I'm going to do a little bit like Jim Thompson. I'm told like, uh, by him and others like he used to do. I, and, uh, I'm going to work the floor of the General Assembly every day there in session. Get to know everybody. I'll be in every, com com uh, every committee meeting that I is, is relevant for what's going on. I'm going to be on the floor. I'll be buttonholing members. I'll be pushing legislation. 
We need to work and get bipartisan solutions. The real solutions need to be bipartisan. They're not going to get done on a one-party basis. Um, and uh, uh, to me, it's an honor. I, I'm excited to come work here and, and, and get big change. So thank you for your time. And I'm here to uh, uh, let you get to know me in every possible way. So I'd love to do questions. I think I start with the budget question. OK. Um, and it's really the Amanda Vinicky question. You, you say that you want to cut back the tax uh, to 3% <coughs> over your four years. Uh -huh. That's like an $8 billion hole there. But you want to increase it in some services that some people say don't, don't add up to like a billion dollars. Uh -huh. So how, and you say you want growth, but I mean, we just added 40,000 jobs this last month. So how, how do you make this work? How, and you say you want more money for schools and roads and DNR and some other things. How, how does that all work? Yeah, so let's talk about that. We've got to separate two things. We've got to separate the short term and the long term. Short term, let me say this. We have never had a balanced budget that I can find. If you've found a year where we've had one, I'd love to know it. We've never had one. The politicians, we're required to have one by the Constitution. Our politicians call borrowing revenue so they get away with, you know. We haven't had a balanced budget. Even back in the days when people would say we had a balanced budget or a surplus, we weren't paying into the pensions then. We, we, we kick the can down the road. We don't solve our problems. So can, can we get through next year and come up with some short-term solutions to get through next year's budget? Absolutely. And I'll work with the General Assembly. No, it's, it means that I'll work with the General Assembly to put together some short-term solutions to get through next year's budget. That's very doable. That's what they've been doing for years. The trouble with with our current state government is we're always thinking short-term. How do we get through? What's the what, what, and frankly, we make short-term decisions that cost us more in the long term. I'll get through next year, but what I'm going to demand, and this is this is the key. This is what I hope you'll uh, come to appreciate. While we're getting through the short term, I will be driving and insisting that we made the structural reforms for the long term, which we have not done whatsoever under, under uh, either Pat Quinn or Rob Lagojevich. We have not taken the structural reforms to the long term. We need to have a tax code that is pro-growth. That means low rates, broad base. We need to have a regulatory climate that is pro-business. Otherwise, companies will continue to leave. When the CEO of Caterpillar endorsed me day one in the race, he told me that Caterpillar has been growing all their jobs out of Illinois for years. And they're one of the most important employers. And their jobs are terrific paying jobs. These are great jobs. They're growing them out of Illinois because he said, Bruce, workers' comp costs Caterpillar five times as much in Illinois as it does in the other states. We're growing out. And so, and that's just one example. But it is down, and how are you going to get the Democratic legislature to do this? Okay, so that's a great question. I'll say this. Uh, uh, I won't ascribe names. It's not appropriate. But I'll say Democrats in the General Assembly who I've been meeting with have said to me, Bruce, we need a leader in Springfield. We don't have one. We haven't had one for a while. We need a leader who will take the arrows. That's their term, not my term. Who will take the arrows. We don't take arrows in the General Assembly. That's not what we do. They still have to pass it. How are you going to pass it? Well, on a bipartisan basis. They'll get Republicans to do it, and I'm very active in helping the Republican candidates. And I have many friends uh, who are Democrats in the business community and in uh, politics. I have friends on both sides of the aisle, very close with good working relationships. The key thing is to make sure that the General Assembly members who stick their necks out to take tough votes don't get taken out by the special interest groups that have to be taken on. So you promise you'll fund their campaigns next time? We're, we, are going, we're, we are going to work on a bipartisan basis to be advocates to help the General Assembly members who take tough votes. So what, That's, what, what kind of specific votes are you going to ask them to take that, that are going to put them in jail? The workers' comp reform, that's, tort that's reform. That's going to be one of the short-term solutions that you're talking about? Oh, a tax code overhaul. Uh, closing some corporate tax loopholes. See, we, so to, to get back to the point, so I want to understand we're going to work on a bipartisan basis to solve the problems and take some tough votes. Now let's come back to the policies, short term, long term. First, um, on the, the long term structure reform, workers' comp reform, tort reform, tort reform tax. So you, what, you want to cap on damages? There's a whole bunch of things we can do. We, I mean, again, you've got a Democratic legislature that they've not been for that for 30 years. Why would they be that for that for you when you've just been bad mouth on, on that side of things? Uh, we will get that done. I've had the discussions. You, don't, you don't, just can't do name it. anybody that's going to do this on the Democratic side. Um, I, I mentioned how the process will work. That's the most important thing. That's Which is you pay for their campaign. No, no, I did not. I didn't say. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Um, 
uh, we'll have bipartisan leadership and bipartisan problem solving because because it's needed. And I've had Democrats in the General Assembly say that they agree with me on this. We have to have it. Yeah, it, might be, it might be part of this. I just want to get the question in. State employee count has gone down since George Ryan was governor from 81,600 to 61,500. So if any of your plan involves cuts to the workforce, which of course Springfield has seen a lot of, we've already lost 20,000 state employees just in the last 12 years under these Democrats. So are you saying you can cut more and should there be cut, should there be cut more? Well, uh, we need to make the government efficient and effective and highly productive. Um, even Pat Quinn's own people have said there's a half a billion dollars of wasted spending in the procurement process in central management services. That's from Pat Quinn's own people. Uh, I think that number is low. Um, half a billion dollars is pretty material. Um, and, and when, I, when I'm when i speaking with uh, f uh, folks, I have uh, many friends who uh, work inside the government. And they've told me, Bruce, the problems you are summarizing are actually worse than you're saying. I mean, we've got a lot of cronyism, incompetence. A lot of good people have been pushed out of state government, I've been told, and I've talked to some of them who are highly qualified, but they've not been treated well in the last 12 years. And they've been replaced by folks who maybe aren't as qualified and who are there because of you know political connections or campaign roles, et cetera. We, we, we've lost the competence in many of the departments, and it's been re replaced by a lot more cronyism and a lot more um, uh, corruption and patronage. So That's, when, when you want to make government more efficient, would that include uh, privatizing some of the things that the state does now, or even? Well, uh, let me give you some examples. I've been told, and I haven't done the count myself with my own people, but I've been told that state government has 223 financial reporting systems. I think that's accurate. You guys might know. Uh, and even if it's 150, and I've been told that the 223 mostly don't talk to each other. And I've been told that in many departments, technology is not used because there's a fear that um, that might replace a government job. Well, we have a duty. Frankly, the government uh, employees can make more money if they're more productive. And, and the taxpayers deserve to have the most efficient government possible. We're, we're, we have a moral obligation. We have a moral obligation to have an efficient government. And every dollar that's w not spent productively inside government is a, is, a, is a dollar that can't go to our social services, that can't go to our schools, that can't go to small business owners to stay in their pockets so they can build jobs. We, we have a duty to be in a very efficient government. And G Governor Quinn has been a disaster on government efficiency and productivity. After I complained and criticized him for having the largest fleet of state-owned aircraft, he finally said, oh, I guess I might have to start selling planes. That's just, that's more a symbolic, that's not huge money, but it's symbolic of the mindset. There is not an efficiency mindset, there's not a productivity mindset. Other states are making uh, big strides on efficiency and productivity in their governments, and we've got to do that in Illinois, and I'll, that'll be a, a, a key priority for me. But it's government efficiency, cutting wasteful spending, it's tax code overhaul, and it's regulatory um, uh, changes to make it a, a more class, uh, attractive business climate, or uh, critical priorities. Going back on the budget, though, y'all, the state has serious budget problems. Big problems. Boy, are we, it's a mess things, next year. And some of the things you're talking about are long term. Yes. What kinds of short term pain, you know, what are some of the specifics you would be looking at to get through that short term? That, you know, the budget that has we'll, to be again, we'll, we'll have a lot of options to consider. I, I don't want to get out in front of the General Assembly on this. This is going to be a difficult uh, process, it's, it needs to be bipartisan. I don't want to um, end run anybody on this. We're, we're going to start the discussions November 5th. Um, what I don't want to have happen is what Governor Quinn said he would do, push to make the income tax hike permanent, in effect make an income tax increase in the lame duck session when he's on his way out after losing the election and when many members of the General Assembly are not going to be reseated. That would be wrong. We should deal with this in the open, in the proper time frame, and with people who are going to be sticking around um, in the process. Uh, I'll be, but I'll be sitting with uh, members of the General Assembly immediately after the election because we've, we have a gaping budget hole next year. And as uh, I, th I can't remember which newspaper, uh, I, I saw a, a snippet called it a loophole, or a, I can't, a 
some sort of budget. It, the, the, the budget problem next year is far bigger than is typically viewed. I mean, we have, we have borrowing from next year going into this year. We are uh, not paying our, pay, our, unpay, our payables are rising again. Um, we have a mess. And we still have the current income tax hike in place. It's a, it's a fiasco. So is it going to be rough? Yes. Is it going to be unpleasant? Yes. Is it going to need to be bipartisan? Yes. And I'm going to lead the process. I'm not going to hide. And I'm not going to, I, I want everything on the table and we'll solve the problem together. The key though is while we're getting through the short term that we make the long term decisions and we help the, to, to become a growth state and that we work with both members of the general, both parties in the General Assembly to support their members who stick their necks out. Does that mean it's going to be revenue neutral that you're going to keep the level of uh, tax income coming in, <coughs> the same as it is now through your service taxes, uh, just flatter? Again, I'm not uh, giving any specifics of the short term yet. It's, it's inappropriate. So it might be as much in taxation as we have now. It's uh, no. What I've been what I've been very clear on is we've got to reduce the spending and the overall tax burden. I've been crystal clear on that. Okay, we need. That's right. We, we, we've got it. What I've said is I want to get the income tax down to three percent over four years. I want to uh, modernize our sales tax code. Which is services? Uh, which includes one of the ways we we can all discuss which services, but we modernize the the, the uh, uh, sales tax to include services. But we overhaul the entire tax code. We are the state of special deals. We have a lot of what I call corporate welfare. Um, we have a lot of companies who are politically connected who aren't paying their fair share of uh, taxes, and I want to close as many of those as possible. I'm going to push that really hard. I want a level playing field, broad base, low rates. That's what the high growth states do. Uh, but to, to be crystal clear, reduce the overall spending and reduce uh, the overall tax burden. Okay. While, while, while in increasing education spending. And, and so and this, is the, this is the most important thing. Education, I've been, I'm an education advocate. It is the single most important thing we do together as a community. When we, have, when we spend taxpayers' money, which we always have a moral obligation to spend wisely, education should come first. I've said it my, all this campaign, I've said it my whole life, and I've donated tens of millions of dollars to public education to, uh, to improve it. Pat Quinn, has one of, the, and one of the reasons I'm running is he is a disaster on public education. He has, he's been in Springfield off and on for 32 years, I think, something like that. Education not on his agenda anywhere, ever. And the one thing he's done... He talks about it all the time, just like everybody in your job. <laughs> he's... And, <laughs> and, and early so, childhood was a big thing for him last year. And, and, he, and, he's, he talks about it all the time. and, he, and he's cut early education funding. But this, look, look at the results. Look at what he's been around to Springfield for 32 years. Education's been nowhere. And uh, he's cut significant, uh, over half a billion dollars from, uh, from school funding. He says, well, it was, but, but it was for pensions. It was, it was pensions. He says it's His, because the stimulus funding went away, but which he didn't control because it's federal. He has, he has dropped. He's dropped it's school funding. When you travel the state, uh, Bernie, I've traveled 145,000 miles, 97 counties. I can't find a school district who said, boy, our school funding's been good. Most of them say our school funding's been cut. Are they making it up? They are not making it up. Are you going to support Senate Bill 16 then, which reorganizes the way that school money is distributed, rather than just pouring more money onto already wealthy districts? Uh, I don't support that specific bill. I haven't studied every detail of it yet, so I can't support that. What do you support about it? Then? Okay, so I support two things. First, I support increasing the overall state support for education. And do you know so, Right now, um, Do you know we, what percent education is right now? it's a significant uh, percentage. I don't know the exact percentage, no. Um, we need to increase state support. We're, I th believe, 49th out of 50 states. I believe that's correct, either 48th or 49th out of 50 states on state revenue support for education. We overly rely on local property taxes. I'd like to see the shift from over reliance on local property taxes to more of a balance between local property taxes and general state revenue, number one. Number two, I do support overhauling the um, education funding formula for the state. I support that. I don't yet support, and, and uh, I don't know enough detail, and I'm not going to support a bill that I don't know every detail on, uh, the B Senate Bill 16. I think that, from what I've been told, has some issues that I don't agree with. But I don't want to comment on that any, sp any specific bill yet. What I will say is more overall ge uh, re general revenue support and change the formula so that it's more transparent, more open, and more equitable around the state. If you elected, would you meet the Senator Menard? Absolutely. Absolutely. Going back. 
I'm sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. Doubling back on budget, you just touched on the issue of potential sales taxes uh -huh. on services. Uh -huh. uh, most of the independent analyses are saying about $600 million total being generated from them. Number one, do you agree with that figure? Do you all think it's on track? And number two, can you talk us through the guiding principles, kind of the yeah, general that's things great. that led you to pick those services? Yeah. Um, let me first say this. We need to overhaul the entire tax code. Everything should be on the table. Sales tax, fuel tax, use fees, income tax, real estate tax, et cetera. And we should look at everything. And we should compare ourselves to states around America, especially the states that are growing rapidly. Compare ourselves. What do we tax highly that they don't? What do they tax that we don't? What, let's, let's learn from other states and apply some principles. Overall, the, every economist would agree that I've ever heard from, and I was an economics person as my background, broad base, low rates is the most pro-growth. Simple, flat, broad base, low rates. Um, in Illinois, we have a, a narrow base compared to most states, and we have some high rates. So we're, we're not in what the most economists would say the best the pro-growth uh, position. Um, when it comes to specific taxes, what we did is we said sales tax needs to be uh, modernized. Most well-run states include some services along with products. So that's what that's what the principle. I want to get on the table. I want everybody to know, as governor, I'm going to drive an, a, a service sales tax overhaul. Now, which specific services do we include? I will debate and work with the General Assembly on. We, we, we threw out some examples of what we could and probably should include. It's not exhaustive, it's not exclusive, and it's not like, well, everything on that list absolutely has to be there. I'm not saying that. I'm getting the principle on the table. I've got to work with the General Assembly on the specifics. But to me, it's not right. It's both not fair and it's also not good economic policy to have a tax code where if a, a lower middle income family has to pay a sales tax to buy shoes for their uh, daughter to go to school, they pay a sales tax. But if a business person leases a plane in Illinois, they don't pay a sales tax. Other states have a tax on that transaction. We can find a way to, to balance the tax code and modernize it. Other states have done it. We haven't. And that's, that, that's, the, that's the key principle. I'm not today ready to say, well, we have to tax this, and we absolutely should never tax that. I'm not saying it. I'm getting the principle on the table, and I know we need to broaden the base and try to lower the rates. You've said also that uh, I believe at one time that the, the the examples that you included in your plan were things that would not hit everyday people. The largest revenue producer on that list is legal services, which I think a lot of everyday people use legal services, do they not, for, for doing wills, adoptions, whatever it is. And so it, it doesn't that become kind of a regressive tax on on middle class, lower class, people who might have to use legal services? Well, then, you know what, if, if that was a major portion of your average lower income family's budget, maybe, maybe that shouldn't be on the list. That's not my understanding. I mean, people do spend some money on legal services, but not, it's not one of the core uh, major items in a, a typical family's budget. My point is, let's look at what well-run states do. Let's broaden the base, lower the rates, become growth. Frankly, what the, mo the best thing I can do for a lower middle income family in this state is make sure the schools for their kids are fantastic and make sure we've got a booming economy so that lower income family can become a middle income family. That's the best thing I can do for them. And if modernizing the tax code um, and a certain thing that they might spend a little bit of their budget on maybe cost a tiny bit more, but they now have three great job opportunities for the breadwinners in the family to choose from, boy, that's a good trade-off. And that's the kind of trade-off, that's the kind of strategic <laughs> thinking that we got to bring to the process and that I want to drive. Pat Quinn is clueless on economics, clueless on business, clueless on economic growth, and he's had six years to lead ref reforms. And all we did was waste years fighting about a pension bill that I believe is unconstitutional and frankly isn't fair to retirees because it reduces their benefits for retired people. As long as you brought up pensions, there are some radio ads running in this area down Tracy. I don't know if you're familiar with these things. He is talking to state employees, said that under your, your elected governor, their pensions are going to be protected, including the COLA. Uh, is that, in fact, the case that under your plan, where you would freeze pensions the way they are and move people to a 401k, they would continue to receive their COLAs in perpetuity? 
I've said from day one that it's un unconstitutional <laughs> to reduce pension benefits to somebody who's retired. I don't think that's fair, and I don't think it's constitutional. Whatever the structure is in their pensions, that's the deal. We can all be unhappy that we, uh, we let our politicians commit to that deal. And I think, frankly, I think we've got into this mess because of the conflict of interest with the campaign contributions from the folks that, ne that negotiate the pensions with the politicians. This is what I've railed against. I get called anti-union when I criticize this. It's not, it's not being anti-union. No, <laughs> it's, it's that conflict of interest. I'll be the, uh, I've got to stand up. The tax, somebody's got to be in the loop on this who's not being given that campaign cash and will fight for taxpayers. That's one of the reasons I'm running. But Back to your point. Here, let me get the, oh, okay. so I, I've, I've said from day one, if somebody's retired, they got their deal. If somebody's paid in and accrued benefits through today, they got their deal. I think our Constitution's pretty clear. We have some of the strongest constitutional language in the nation. Pensions will not be diminished or impaired. Okay, well, if you got a contract and the, and the pension contract says you get this, and then you go, and then a politician goes, well, I, I, I signed that contract, but I'm, I was just kidding. I'm taking it away from you. I think that's what the Constitution is designed to stop. What I've said from day one is let's end the current system, freeze it where it's at, don't reduce anybody's benefits, don't reduce anybody's benefits, but have a second pension plan for future work starting tomorrow, not only for new hires, but for current workers. That, that, that the government and that the, ta that the workers pay into that's more flexible, more affordable, more controlled by the employee, more of a defined contribution plan. Now, we could offer hybrid plans. We could offer a defined benefit plan in the future if that's what people really, really want. But they've got to be very different than what we've had in the past, much more affordable, more flexible, and, and more uh, for, for the benefit of the taxpayers. Our current system is... Um, it's not affordable, but, and, but and we've got to we've got to go in a different direction. The point is, then, do you would guarantee to keep in place the largest single uh, driver of increased pension costs, at the same time as moving everybody into a four hundred one k plan? So you're going to continue to pay money more and more money out of these pension plans without putting employer contributions or employee contributions into them. How do they survive? Well, well, we have to put more government money into the old pensions. We have an obligation. And we have, a, we, have a, we have a constitutional language saying that we're not going to reduce those benefits. You wouldn't divert government money into the 401k plan, though? We, well, we're going to put, we have to put money into that, too. So you're going to pay for both pension systems? Uh, sure. I mean, we have, yeah, absolutely. we got we got to chip in our, sh the, the taxpayer's share, and the, the, and the employees got to pay their fair share. You know, That's of the, course. When the attorney general candidate of the Republican Party was here, Paul Schiff, I asked about, is going to a 401k plan tomorrow for current employees constitutional? And he said, well, purely if that's it, probably not, because those people are counting on those benefits. You actually have a lawyer who told you that that's going to be constitutional? Because you, you, know, yes. you, you weren't for the plan they were for. Absolutely. The answer is yes. I've talked to many attorneys about it. Anybody See, in particular you what, can what, what, the, what the Constitution, yeah. what the Constitution um, uh, says is pension benefits will not, not be diminished or impaired. Is it diminishing your pension if you've worked 25 years and you want to work 30 and you're counting on the 30-year pension based no, on what you're, what, you're what, you're, what you're saying? That's a, that's a false argument. Nobody, nobody, when they start working, knows they're going to work for 30 years or knows what their pay, pay is going to be um, in the 29th year. That all okay, goes uh, in the pension. Maybe our Constitution says as they do if they're working for the government or for a school district. No, it doesn't say that. And uh, I'm very confident that changing the future is uh, constitutional. It's fair. It's, uh, nobody's, nobody's promised anything in the future. What they, what they are promised and protected on is their contract of what they've earned in the past. I'll bet you some people would argue differently, but we'll find I, out. I, I, wouldn't well. be, I wouldn't be surprised if people argue. I'm very confident that the taxpayers will win that argument. Tenure is a flawed concept, and you think that, that it should also not apply to university prof uh, professionals, professors. You said there's a lot of ways to protect freedom. Job, get, jobs guaranteed for life is not a good one. Wouldn't, like, if you really want to do away with tenure in universities, wouldn't that make Illinois universities less competitive than others if people are looking to come here to teach? Um, yeah, if, if, that, if that's a key driver for our competitiveness, then I wouldn't want to push it as hard or w maybe we'll modify it. Okay, We've got, that, do, you, do you think it should be done away with? As I, I've always said, it's not fair uh, for taxpayers or, or school children if a teacher is ineffective and it's virtually impossible to be moved or, or um, 
to leave the position. That's just not fair. It's not fair to taxpayers, and it's not f fair to the students. I've always believed that. We need a way to protect our teachers from arbitrary, capricious uh, decisions from their employers. Absolutely. Yes. Um, um, now, universities a bit different because it, it's so competitive for the you know most genius level <laughs> researchers, et cetera, and and universities are competing nationally for uh, folks who are cutting edge on research, et cetera. And if we've got to do certain things to be competitive, I'm very open to that. Um, but Just the, for the geniuses or for all of the professors? I, here's the whole key, and this I'm glad you brought up because the key word for me is competitiveness. We, Illinois needs to be competitive, and today we're not. On almost any regard, we've got to be competitive. Um, and our universities, for example, our in-state tuition is not competitive whatsoever. We, we are, are, it's not fair that our families, our parents, have to have their students go out of state to get less tuition than the, than the in-state tuition. I've got friends who've gone to Mizzou. So we need more money for universities. And we need to bring down here. So right. That's partly which, part. Which it's part. Life. It's partly. It's partly more state support. But you know what? A lot of it is, our um, state uh, universities have become to look a lot like the state government: bureaucratic, wasteful, inefficient, hu un unaffordable pensions, um, unaffordable work rules, unaffordable bureaucracy. And we need to change that critically. When you compare, I've looked at the numbers. When you look at the overhead burden that our state universities put on. The, the classrooms. And I want the money in the classroom with the, the professor and with the students, not in the layers of administrative costs. State universities in Illinois, much more overhead cost than, than uh, other state universities. Speaking of tenure, um, switching gears a little bit, what would your first 100 days of tenure on the job look like, and how would you shake up Springfield? And also, um, how would you formulate your cabinet? What are the qualities you would be looking for in that? Okay. Um, well, as I mentioned, I think the job really is going to start November 5th because we've got such a big crisis, financial crisis and leadership crisis, that we'll, I want to start working with the General Assembly. Obviously, I don't have the power to make the, the formal decisions until uh, mid-January, but I want to be in good communication, number one, and begin to talk about the plan so we can hit the ground running. Uh, in January. I want to try to put together the most talented team of people that's ever been assembled to turn around a state government. And I've, I've been very blessed. I've been contacted by people, and they're not just, you know, campaign donors. These are people who, you know, are um, experts in pensions, experts in Medicaid, experts in technology, experts in, in operations, who've called me and said, Bruce, if you can win this race, or when you were in this race, I'd be honored to offer my services. And many of them have said, I probably don't even need to take a salary, at least not for a year or two. Because I, I love Illinois, too, and I, this is a time to give back. Because we can see the, the opportunity to do a big turnaround is there. I'd like to turn, have a, a very talented team of experts. And I'll get Democrats and Republicans. I'm not a, one of these people, well, I have to, what's, your, what's your Republican credential or whose campaign did you work on before I'll consider hiring you? I'll work, I'll have Democrats and Republicans as part of our administration. I want deep expertise and true public servants uh, to be part of our team. I also want um, our government to reflect uh, the diversity of our community and our state. I do want African American leaders, and I've been honored. I've had many su uh, support me in the campaign, but also offer to be part of our administration. Business leaders uh, in the African American community, uh, leaders. Uh, in the Hispanic community, leaders in the um, Polish community and, uh, and other communities. And I'm, I want to make sure that our government reflects. Um, I also obviously want many uh, women. I want to make sure that women are at least half the administration. I'm proud to say I've got, I've got uh, I'll, have, I have the first, I'll have the first Latina lieutenant governor in Illinois history. I want women helping lead this state in all in positions up and down. But I want an inclusive administration. I want a super talented administration. And, I've, and I want to try to end this patronage system where you get the government job because of who you're related to or whose campaign you worked on. And then we've got, again, I've got a very full agenda because we've got to get through the short-term financial crisis, and it is a crisis. It's worse than anybody's talking about. Um, and even Quinn doesn't like to talk about it because the reality is the income tax, he hasn't let the income tax even fix our problems. He doesn't even want to talk about all the shenanigans that are even going on now with the income tax hike in place in order to come up with the money. And his, his answer is, and right now, he's running around the state right now committing hundreds of millions of dollars to projects 
to buy votes with taxpayer money. He's going to, he's, I think he's Southern Illinois, just promised a project down there because he's going for an endorsement of the local paper. Went to Quincy, project, promised money for a project there because he wants the endorsement of the paper. He's running around making promises of taxpayer money to try to, you know, buy votes and influence folks. That's what he does. That's what these politicians do, use taxpayer money to buy votes. So you're not going to have any projects to announce when you're governor? You're not going to do a infrastructure plan? Every, every, every governor does an infrastructure plan. I will have a detailed infrastructure plan and we'll grow our infrastructure. What I won't do with Pat Quinn, like Pat Quinn is, is fail to invest in our infrastructure for years and, and, and run around at the last minute making promises where he doesn't have the money to keep them. And what you said about, uh, you know, who you're not going to hire, does that mean all of these Republican county chairmen or precinct committee members in Sangamon County are not going to get hired onto your administration? Uh, they, the, <laughs> talented people will be uh, the ones we hire. I'm going to bring in talented people. Whenever that you talk about bringing in talented people, um, all leaders are visionaries. And at times, sometimes our uh, staff does not always agree with us. How will you handle situations like that? Well, that's for sure. I mean, the lead, you know, it, the, no two people are going to agree 100% of the time. It will never happen. Uh, I want to get the most talented uh, team of folks around me that I can find. I want to let them make their decisions. I'm not a micromanager. I'm a strategist, I'm a salesperson, and I'm a leader, I'm a motivator. Um, and I'm going to be traveling a lot. I'm going to be traveling the state and the nation and the world on my nickel, not on this taxpayer nickel, recruiting companies to come here, recruiting talent to come here, um, getting ideas on good government policy for our state. Uh, but I'll also be traveling the state, you know, meeting with voters, listening to their concerns. I've, you know what, one of the things i got to tell you, I'm surprised how much I've enjoyed this campaign. It's been brutally hard. It's not fun being knifed in the back every day and make all these false accusations. It's hard on my family. But, you know, the people of Illinois are phenomenal. I've loved it. It's been very energizing. And I look forward to spend a lot of time with the voters once I'm governor as well. So I'll be traveling a lot. But I look forward to being based here in Springfield. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, be, uh, to me it's an honor. To me it's an honor to be in the governor's residence. And I want the government based out of Springfield. Can you talk for a minute about local government, sir? Sure. Yeah, so it's a great question. Uh, I've, and I've said from day one in this campaign, um, mayors and county chairmen are CEOs. They're just like me. I'm dealing with some CEO for the state. They're CEO for their local government, their communities. They have to have balanced budgets. They need a good business climate. They need value for taxpayers. They need great schools. Same things I need for the whole state. I will form a task force day one. And I've said it from the beginning, and I've already started talking to people about it, who will be on it. Task force of mayors from around Illinois, county chairmen from around Illinois, and school superintendents from around Illinois. I've said it. We're talking. We're identifying the people right now. They're very excited. And I've said, look, we have a hugely expensive, inefficient layer cake of government in Illinois. We have 7,000 units of government, double, I believe, the numbers I've seen, roughly double the average state, 2,000 more units of government than the number two state. Why do we have that? What units of local government do you want to eliminate? I want to solve that together as the task force. I want to set the goal. Are you going to have years and years? Yeah, what, did, the governor, did the governor drive it? Are you going to have townships? Did the governor have a legislature of his own party? And this will be know, bipartisan. You said this in the six month thing. I called local legislators here, all Republican. They all said that can't happen. What can't because happen? Because our, our townships are our most effective governments. Local governments are the most effective that serve the people. How do you fight, how do you fight that? I've watched school districts try to consolidate for 30 years. And the, Maybe they get it done over time. So this is. Requires a majority in each of the that's right. That are consolidated and, and, and who's going to change the law? Are you going to make them change the law? Uh, I, I, uh, uh, Bernie, I said the process. We are going to have a bipartisan process to support the General Assembly members that stick out their necks and take the tough votes. That's the key. So to, to your. Yes. So, so I'm not going to today list off the specific ones that I want to personally close because it's going to be a bipartisan solution. What I want to do is set the agenda. Let's have a goal to take us from 7,000 to 4,000. Let's have that be the goal. Let's work together on how we can best get that done. We have mosquito abatement districts and water reclamation districts. And, and, okay. Well, we have, so we have 7,000. 
it can be on the table. I'm not saying that that's what, that what we should cut. It can be, it's, it's, it can be something that can be considered. Everything should be on the table. Here's every, I, I realize it's easy to say, well, it's not possible. You can't do it. That's certainly, you know what, but the reason I'm running is I don't want to take anything for granted. I don't want to take anything as a given, and I want to be a bipartisan problem solver. We have to do it. We don't have a choice. We have to do it. We've entered into an economic death spiral, and we can't stay at the bottom. We, and we know what we have to try to do. Now we need a leader who will do, uh, push it on a bipartisan basis. So is the purpose of eliminating units of local governments to just get rid of units of local governments? Save money. To get rid of their functions? Um, well, some functions are redundant. Their functions, then how do you save money? By eliminating redundant functions. And also, and redundant, functions. redundant functions. And then, and then there may well be some, some functions. I would. In, in every organization I've ever been part of, it's not too hard to find some functions that just probably aren't that needed. And if you want to get rid of 3,000 and you can't name one? Um, name. The mosquito abatement district you, you mentioned, is, if you can't name any broader category of governments that should be gone if we want to get rid of 3,000 of them? Well, what are the categories? Schools, townships, Schools, cities, uh, water cities, reclamation, you know. Yeah, yeah. Sewer districts? Yeah, all that. We should look at all. How long realistically would this take? And you're laying out a lot of really ambitious things. Tax reform, tort reform, workers' comp. Where does this fall in terms of the priorities? Um, I, th yeah, I think it's a big priority. I think, I think this is one of the things, one of the reasons we need a big, super talented team is to help drive this. I'll tell you this. I've, I've discussed this with mayors and county chairmen around the state and with Democrats and Republicans. And I've said, this. you know what? I haven't had a single one who say, bad idea. I have not a single one who said anything other than, if I could be on that commission, I'd love to be on it. And many of them have said, Bruce, here's, here's 10 ideas I got right now that I'd like to see us do to cut out the wasteful spending and to cut out the redundancy and to change the unfunded mandates in Illinois. Unfunded mandates, stunning. Forcing local um, um, units of government to spend money they don't have and that where many of the local communities would say, we, that mandate isn't productive, it's wasteful spending, we got to get rid of it. Can and, you give me an example? I don't want to. Safety? Signs that you have to put up or what? Um, requirements, we have requirements, um, oh, boy, unfunded mandates, there's hundreds. Well, there's so, so I'll have to send them to you. I mean, I can't. I've got, here, here's the issue. We have we were one of the largest, most inefficient government structures in America. That's just true. And when I've sat with the mayors and they've said, Bruce, here's the list of 10 things we've got to change. We can really save a lot of money. I've, I'm collecting these. And I don't I'm, remember any of those. Anyway, that's fine. I, it's not the right time to get into that. It's not the right time to get into that. Oh, after the election is? Yeah, yeah, that's what fine. i got to do. It. <laughs> that's fine. Um, Absolutely. I got... One of your favorite subjects these days, probably. You have said that the other hundred people who are hired as staff assistants at IDOT, and I know they just imposed a monitor, should be fired. This was reminiscent to me of when Robert Blavich took office and he said, all oh, these cronies for George Ryan, let's fire these 31 people and hand out a list. $600,000 in legal fees later, some of those people lost their jobs after the appellate court agreed. About nine of them kept their jobs. Uh, I asked Blavich when he said that, do you know any of these people and do you know what they do? And he said, no. Do you know any of these 100 that you want fired, and do you know what they do, and might they be okay, or is it just fire them because they were hired to the wrong system? Um, it's really more the latter. It's they were hired illegally. And so you want them fired? Yes. Do you know any of them? Uh, I know two of them. Who? Um, why, would, why do you want to know the names? I don't know, because it, it puts a face on it. I'm not going to name names. Okay. Um, I think executive order is one of the most important uh, uh, tools that the governor has in Illinois. One of the reasons I was willing to take this Herculean task on is the governorship in Illinois is one of the most powerful political offices in the United States. The executive order ability to impact many things, not everything, but many issues. You have executive order ability that many governors don't have. 
uh, you have line item veto, a mandatory veto. You've got a veto. You've got veto um, uh, capability that is very um, impactful in the legislative process and can be a big negotiating tool uh, with the General Assembly. Um, you appoint most of the key positions, virtually all the key positions uh, in the government, um, and that has huge leverage and impact, especially in a government that's so full of the patronage that's uh, part of the system. Um, you control the checkbook and the spending as governor, um, and as a governor who's willing to actually truly um, drive efficiency and, and cut some costs and wasteful spending, um, that's big uh, uh, opportunity and big negotiating ability with the General Assembly. If a governor, like we've had for 12 years, a governor always wants to spend more than what the, what the um, General Assembly says we have in the budget, the, 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 the governor is pretty weak. I mean, the governor has no, uh, you can't even do every, every project that the governor wants. But if the governor is willing to spend less than what the General Assembly says we could possibly raise money for, that's a lot of uh, negotiating leverage. So do you and have I'm, an idea for an executive order that you would issue early in your administration to correct some foul that you see going on? Uh, I've got uh, my some of our legal advisors working on that right now. I've got actually a list of three that I think we might want to go after early on. But again, I, I know you guys want me to say specific. Yeah, I'm not going to say. Can you give a broad outline of the kind of thing? Well, like, I've, yeah, I, I guess I, like, um, you know, I mean, the president has come under fire from Republicans who feel he uses the executive order, what, what parameters would you use? You know, how do you avoid overusing it? That's, that's just, that's leadership and judgment. I mean, how, you know, exercise good judgment. I don't want to overuse it, but I certainly want to use the, the, the powers of the office in the, in the, in the best way possible. Um, what, uh, uh, to give you some parameters that I've been told both my, by our legal advisors as well as by, I'll tell you, by members of the General Assembly have told me, Bruce, you know what, we're, we're excited to have you be here because you know what, the sp okay, these are numbers I've gotten from the, the, some of my Democrats in the General Assembly who said, Bruce, the, the governor has about 150 levers of power. That's their number. I didn't, you know, I'm just telling you, relaying the, on a, the, the speaker has about 100 levers of power. The mayor and the president of the Senate have about 50 levers of power. You're in a position where you can do some, if you're willing to lead and stick your neck out and take some arrows, you can drive some big change. And I'm saying, I think you're right, based on what, what I've studied about the government structure and what my legal team's telling me, I think that sounds about right. Um, but it's going to be a tough process, and it's, it's going to, to get the real solutions, most of it's going to have to be bipartisan. Well, what the final lever of power of the governor? The veto, Pat, the okay. mandatory veto. The, the appointment abilities and the key, you know, some of, I've so listed are, some. Are there some restrictions on the governor's executive order powers? That sure, are, sure. Okay. And there's there's limits on the vetoes too. There's limits on everything. It's not, no, this is not. Uh, you know, you're not Superman. I mean, you can't just you know. Um, a lot of uh, I know I've heard the words drive results a lot, and I know you do. Uh, you've been very successful, um, and you use your business record as saying that you can do similar things in Illinois. Uh, I, I'm going to refer to the Tribune story on the nursing home trial going on mm -hmm. in Florida, the trans health care. And it, it says here, and this is the one where uh, Mr. Janata was running it, who was one of your people, and there was uh, <clears throat> Mr. Barry Sachs, who was the old guy in a wheelchair, who said he, he didn't even know that he bought the company that had a billion dollars in judgments against it. And then it's, the Tribune says of you, in February, he told the Tribune he hadn't had much to do with trans health care after being on its board for about a year when GTCR began the chain in 1998. However, the Tribune reported Monday that a court document in the bankruptcy case indicates Ron has still served on the Trans Healthcare Board four years after the inception of the chain. What's more, the plaintiff attorneys allege in other documents filed under seal that the nursing home company was run right up until the transaction with <coughs> Sachs by an investment committee of GTCR partners that included Rauner. So, a couple of things. Is this one of those situations where you try to avoid responsibility after buying the company and having problems arise and then shifting off the company to a third party? And also, is this a problem? Because you've told me very different things about like how your daughter got into Walter Payton prep. Uh, did, you, did you know you were misleading the Tribune when you said a year and it was four or more? Yeah, it was a few years. I was wrong. My memory was faulty. Uh, it was a few years, but it was long, you know, it was in the formation of the company lo long before some of these problems emerged. Um, 
Uh, unfortunately, that's a, it turned out to be a, a poorly run company. Went bankrupt. We lost all our money. Uh, tragedy. Uh, my heart goes out to uh, families who lost loved ones. That's being dredged up in, for political gain right now. It's a tragedy. Is if there was any, record? if the, I'm sure it is. Okay. Sure. Um, You're uh, dredging up everything about Quinn's record, right? Sure. And our and, and well and so that company failed. If there was any wrongdoing, any illegal uh, wrongdoing, I hope it's punished to the maximum extent of the law. I don't believe there was any, but if there is, I hope it's punished. That's one out of 400 and I don't know. 430, 450 companies. Most of our companies are dr dramatic successes, and we've driven some of the top investment returns of any investment company in the United States. So I, proud I of that. I had a question the other day um, in a debate of can you name a company that created jobs in Illinois? Is there one? <laughs> um, there are many, many. Um, and here's, and here's one? so, okay, I, I know everybody wants to go s get into specific, to so put a face on it, I guess is your phrase. Or okay, so, 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 and again, I encourage folks to come to um, look at the website to understand the companies. It's not like we're hiding things. I'm, and what, in the campaign, you can only communicate certain things. What I want people to know is I've gotten great results and, and I've given back in the community and have a big heart. To, to your specific point, what I want people to know is we've financed hundreds of companies. Most of them have been terrifically successful. We've made better retirements for our investors, teachers, police officers, and government workers. Um, and we've, we've had great economic growth and great, great economic success. That's true. Now, so if folks say, you know, name companies. Well, I mean, I could... Actient is one I named the other day. Like um, AT, AT, uh, company called ATI. It's a it's a physical therapy company, a big employer in Illinois. Another, and grow. another quick question. The story is just coming out. Indosin, uh, which was uh, this company, this drug company you had, and Indosin is a for baby heart problems. And the price after your company bought it went from twenty six dollars per vial to five hundred dollars per vial, and then you later sold the company for nine hundred million dollars. Isn't that the kind of thing that drives health care costs, and does that show a social conscience? Uh, I think you can look at my personal record and see I've got an incredible social conscience. I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm running for governor, and what, the reason I've donated tens of millions of dollars back into our community. I've been well, very strong, my wife and I. Drug, you know, I, can't, I was not on that board. I don't know their specific pricing for their products. I'm sure that people could criticize a specific company for its prices on different products. I can't, I don't know, I can't comment on that. What are some of the types of businesses that you believe would thrive in Illinois? Boy, you know what? The, one of the great things about Illinois is virtually every company could thrive in Illinois. We, we have such great people and great location. And that we, uh, manufacturing should be thriving. Right now, we're losing manufacturing jobs. Transportation, tru trucking, and logistics should be thriving. And we are not. Um, you know, when, when Rob Lagojevich I think, uh, I may have the number wrong, but I think he tripled licensing fees tr for trucking firms in Illinois when he became governor. And you know what? They all moved to Indiana. I mean, we, we, we have not become uncompetitive. Ma and, and when manufacturers leave, far and away the number one reason they tell me is workers' comp. But we could, we could be booming in manufacturing. We should be booming in trucking and logistics and transportation. The good news is in agriculture, we are strong. And uh, unfortunately, we're you know pushing some of our agricultural service product companies to other states because of our taxes and our regulations. But at least our farmers are generally doing pretty well, although they're suffering with our property taxes and our lack of investment in our infrastructure. But to get to it, agriculture sector could be booming even more than it is. Um, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, um, uh, uh, health devices, et cetera. We're doing pretty well there, although some of those companies are leaving. We could be doing far more. Um, um, co consumer products. Historically, Illinois has, has been pretty good in consumer products. We could do far more. One of the areas that we are way under our weight and where I will push very aggressively is in the technology sector. Um, that, that's where so much of the economic growth is in, in America, and it's one of the reasons that California is thriving despite uh, being not a particularly uh, business-friendly state. Same thing for uh, Boston and New York, because the tech sector is booming there. It's, oh, it's here in Illinois, it's got some growth in it, but we could be doing far more. It's one of the reasons I went on the strategic advisory board for the chancellor at the University of Illinois. The U of I is one of the great computer science and technology schools in the world. We're defunding the school, we're not growing it, and their graduates, 
I have a pipeline to Silicon Valley in Seattle. I want to cut off that pipeline and keep their graduates and their researchers in Illinois, <laughs> help, it, help the U of I expand, and I want to see the technology sector leveraging Champaign-Urbana's success booming in Illinois, and I'll be a big priority. Another one is tourism. I, I got to know tourism by chairing the Tourism Bureau at, at Chicago. Chicago was not doing well in tourism for years. Uh, Mayor Daley was frustrated. He said, Bruce, can you help me figure out how do we get tourism going better in Chicago? And I said, well, I'm not an expert. I st I'll take a look at it. I studied it for six months. I, then I said yes to the job. Um, I became chairman of the T Tourism Bureau in Chicago. Put in a new board, new staff, new marketing plan. And not e I won't take 100% of the credit for what we did for why Chicago. Chicago is now booming. The tourism, one of the fastest growing tourist destinations in the United States. I won't take all the credit, but, but what we did, major contributor to uh, that turnaround. Uh, again, working bipartisan and coming up with solutions. Tourism can be a big economic driver here in Illinois, and I want to do that for the whole state. We've got such you know, wonderful natural resources and community resources around the state. We can get far more tourists coming here than, than what we've been doing. We're starting to grow in tourism in Illinois, but we can do far better. Uh -huh. and then we'll close it out. Uh -huh. Anybody want to get on the final question? Do you have your positions in the time you've been around the race have evolved in some cases? Uh, the minimum wage, you were against it, now you're more open. Uh, the, the whether public unions are uh, the devil's incarnate here in the state, uh, whether the state income tax hike absolutely has to drop on January 1st, or we can talk about maybe uh, extending it. Why should voters think that the Bruce Rauner they're seeing before the election is the one they're going to get after the election if you're elected? Um, I did look at two things with me. Look at my results in my life and um, look at my heart on how I've given back. That's how people should judge me. Look at what I've done in my life. The success I've driven. I'm a self-made guy. I didn't inherit a nickel. And I care and I give back. And I've driven success and been a leader in virtually everything I've ever done chairman of so many organizations, leader of so many organizations, both civic and philanthropic as well as business, and I've gotten great results. Am I perfect? No. Am I a human being who's got flaws and faults? Yes. Uh, look at me, and do, boy, do we need success in our state government. Pat Quinn's had six years. You can't point to, on, the, on taxes, jobs, schools, corruption, failure. And I think we have a duty in our democracy to vote out politicians and hold them accountable if they don't succeed. And he has not succeeded. He's taken us to the bottom of the barrel. And I think I deserve a chance. G give me four years. And I'll say to the voters, throw me out of office in four years if I don't deliver results. Give me a chance to drive results. I've driven results in my life, and I've given back. I'm not going to take a salary or pension. I'm doing this out of love of the state purely. This is, this is a huge economic drain to me, but to me it's worth it because home is worth sacrificing for and worth fighting for. And let me just address, because I think it's important you raise two, at least, well, a couple issues, two, three. But on minimum wage, I've, I've been quoted out of context, and I've also been very inartful in my words. Okay, my fault. I'm not a human being. So, so, yes, 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 exactly. Because we're, Illinois is not competitive. We're not competitive. One of the reasons we have a higher unemployment rate than the states around us is we have a higher uh, uh, minimum wage than the states around us. So, here's the right way to deal with it. I'm, a, I'm a, you know, I want to get an answer. Eliminating it's not going to happen. I want an answer to how do we get, how do we, um, uh, how do we grow? How do we increase our competitiveness? I've got the answers, and they're two darn good answers. That's what I do, come up with answers. Increase the national minimum wage so it's above, above Illinois, then we don't hurt our competitiveness, which is the reason I've been commenting about the minimum wage. I support that. Great. Then, then, then Illinois companies are now competitive, and we can grow our economy, and we can help our working families. Or increase Illinois' minimum wage, but combine it with pro-growth strategy, workers' comp, tort, tax, so then the businesses aren't causing more unemployment, shedding workers and leaving the state. We're more competitive, and then we can raise the minimum wage and have it better for everybody. So there's, there's answers. There's solutions, bipartisan. We can, I can get that done. Pat Quinn's had six years to fix the minimum wage, and he hasn't. Um, and you said, uh, what was the other, second one you said? Because I just want to hit it. Change on, oh, oh, government unions. Here's the issue. I'm not anti-union. I'm criticizing, and always have been, criticizing the dynamic where a government union leader can give major campaign cash and campaign workers to a politician to get them elected, and then, as, as in that relationship, negotiate pensions, pay, work rules, et cetera, and also get their spouse and their buddies uh, working for that politician, which is what happens all the time. 
And that's a conflict. And we've uh, somebody's got to push back in that. Otherwise, the taxpayers are, are on the hook and being abused. And that's what's going on in Illinois. We, we, we're going the wrong way for our taxpayers. Somebody's got to fight for the taxpayers. You said a year and a half ago you would have a plan to combat that. I asked, does that mean you would ban like union contributions to politicians? You said, I'll have a plan for you soon. That was 18 months ago. You have not had a plan. Is that what you want to do? How would you stop that corrupt system, as you called it? Um, well, the first way I can do it is by not being part of it myself. I'm the, I'm, that's, look at. I mean, you're not taking anything from, well, I guess you don't take from state contract. I mean, you take a lot of money. There you go. Money. Hey, you but just you said take, a key point. you take a lot of money from a lot of people. There you go. You, Bernie, Bernie, you just said the key thing. You know what? Why in Illinois is it illegal for a business that contracts with a state to give a campaign contribution? And while organizations that make huge money from the state government and are basically fundamentally state contractors are basically unlimited. That's the core. That's, we, we, are, we are missing a structural issue, and I'm the one person who can, can stand up to that because I'm not taking money from that. But every other politician, and look at Pat Quinn, oh my goodness. And if I could ask just one more thing about um, freedom of the press and transparency, because uh, your shop is not the most press-friendly shop. You know, I'll send shrimp like questions on five things, I'll get one, one line back an hour later, even a shake up Springfield when he says this. I asked several things about your family and how much land you own. You know, sent like nine questions several months ago. I got one line answer because that's all you guys give. And when you were here with Chris Christie, you only gave one answer. And you used to own a newspaper, the Sun Times, and there's been a bit of an issue with that. Um, how will you deal with people asking questions of your administration? Because it doesn't seem like as a campaigner you like to tell too much. Well, I'd, I'd like to be as open as I possibly can be. I pushed, I'll, tell you, I'll say this, I pushed our staff really hard to have me come here. I had to, you know what, I... Did you know, actually, that you were invited during the primary? Now, how could they not tell you that when we asked them several, several times? They kept you in a bubble then, and you have a staff that doesn't tell you what's going on. But, you know, some things can communicate, some don't, and it's not good to have not have good communication. But I pushed hard to come here. I, I, I want to be as open as I can be. And, and you know what? I just want to solve the problems. I, I have no, I don't want a political career. I had to beg my wife to let me do this. And she said, Bruce, can you do the turnaround in four years, please? Can you please? And I, and I said, and I said, you know what? And I, and, I, and, I, and I said, you know what? I have to, I have to be willing to serve for eight years if I'm going to do this. If the voters, I have to. That's a moral, that's a moral obligation, I think. I can promise you this. I ain't staying longer than eight. And frankly, if, if, if I could get a real transformation so we are a growth state and we got, we're, we've, we've done the, some of the major things, I, you know what, I'm good with that. I, I, I'm doing this because I want results. We've got to become bipartisan and we've got to get balance. We've lost our balance as a state and that's the reason I decided to throw my hat in the ring.